Hey everyone, we have a great show for you today. I am talking to two vestibular juggernauts. And what I mean is, is I'm talking to two experts on the vestibular system. I'm talking to Dr. Kathleen Strauss and Dr. Danielle Tolman. They are both members of VEDA, the Vestibular Disorders Association. Uh, this is a fantastic conversation about what your vestibular system is, why it's important, how to keep it healthy, and what might could go wrong with it, and then what you can do if it does. Anyway, full of information with two wonderful guests and experts, juggernauts, if you will, about the vestibular system. Thanks for listening. Pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. So you are both members of VEDA, the Vestibular Disorders Association. Uh, I guess for my listeners and for anybody else that just happens to find this uh, podcast, what is, well, let's, let's start with this. What is the vestibular system? Can you can you give a brief description or as intricate as you want about what the vestibular system is? Kathleen, why don't you start? Okay, well, the vestibular system is your internal gyroscope. It's really the one of the most primitive systems about the central nervous system. Um, and thus it is deeply uh, nested in the core of the brain at the brain stem level and then deeply within your ear next to the brain protected very carefully by lots of thick bone because it's precious and it has a, a, a lot of important function it's our sense of stillness versus movement it is um, critical in control of stable vision so that we can see while we move and it orients us to vertical, which means it's important for postural control. So I always think about the vestibular system sort of being our gyroscope, feeling movement and feeling no movement, and um, having those three functions, vertical, sense of motion, and eye movement control and coordination. So um, that's the vestibular system in a nutshell. And uh, it's, it's a very important part of our functioning because as a uh, once a baby comes out of the wound, they begin developing and stimulating their vestibular system in order to get all that orientation correct. When it goes wrong, it can impact not only those parts of you with your eyes and your balance and your equilibrium, but can just make you feel rotten in general. It's one of those background systems that we depend on more than we know. This system is small, but mighty. This thing is mm -hmm. the entire balance system or the vestibular system is also connected to your cochlea, which is your hearing organ. And that entire organ is about the size of a dime. And that small, small system, if one little thing goes wrong, all uh, havoc can break loose. You know, we're talking about physical symptoms where you have vertigo and imbalance, but it also brings on some other symptoms such as brain fog, difficulty concentrating, remembering. Um, it can, especially if you're suffering from any sort of vestibular dysfunction, it can make you feel isolated, depressed, anxious. So there's a lot that the whole system plays into the body, not only physically, but emotionally and mentally as well. That was awesome. And now I know why, Kathleen, you are referred to as the dizzy guru. And <laughs> Danielle, you are a vestibuloholic. She Absolutely. is. <laughs> Together, I think we're enough to make your brain explode. <laughs> you, that was that was awesome. Um, very good. Okay, but okay, so you mentioned all the wonderful things that it does and it's involved in, but you also said when things go wrong. So yeah. what, what can go wrong or how do things go wrong? Go ahead, Daniel. Well, I think a good place to start is just mm -hmm. talking about how common it is for something to go wrong. There's a lot of good studies out there that look at the prevalence of vestibular dysfunction. And there was one that not too long ago looked at the prevalence of any sort of vestibular imbalance dysfunction. And it found that in the entire U.S. population, over 40 years old, so men and women over 40 in the U.S., about 35% of that, of that population has some sort of vestibular dysfunction. And then that prevalence only increases as your age population increases. So by the time we're looking at 80-year-olds, so 80 and above, male or female living in the United States, about 85% of that population has suffered from some sort of vestibular or balance dysfunction. And a lot of people aren't even aware of it. You know, there's a very common condition where you have these small crystals that become displaced in your inner ear that causes positional vertigo. So brief bouts of room spinning vertigo when you either lie down, sit up or bend over or look up. And there's a lot of evidence out there that shows one in 10 people over 60 have it. You don't even know they have it, but it makes them more likely to fall. It makes them symptomatic. 
Um, it can also affect other aspects of life that affect their quality of living. So it's really interesting just to look at how pop, not popular, but how prevalent vestibular dysfunction is. But if you say the term vestibular, a lot of people will go, what was that? What is vestibular? I don't have right. one of those. <laughs> Let me, I want to add something to that because I like how you said they don't even know they have it. It doesn't mean that they don't feel symptoms or know something's not quite right, but they don't necessarily have a proper diagnosis. So people do usually have a symptom and feel it. It's not like, you know, a, a, a disorder that you're, you're not aware of. So they're aware something's not right, but they probably don't know what it is. And in going and talking about, hey, I just don't feel myself. Maybe they use the word dizzy. Maybe they feel a little off balance. Maybe they feel like they're having blurred vision, whatever it is. Those are pretty ambiguous terms for the doctors. And so a lot of times people will report early symptoms that just haven't been picked up for a long time. Um, so in that way, I agree with you. They don't know they have a vestibular problem, but they might know something's not right. And the people who love them are frustrated as well, not knowing which way to go, which doctor to see, and how to get them to just feel free to move again. Or they so, even explain away symptoms too. You know, a lot, of, a lot of doctors say, oh, that's just blood pressure. I can't mm -hmm. tell you how many patients I've had been told, oh, that's part of getting older. Mm. Well, dizziness is never normal. Div dizziness and imbalance is never part of just getting old. Um, it can always be addressed up until the day that we die. Um, so, you know, a lot of people kind of explain it away or their doctors kind of explain it away and it just goes unrecognized or undiagnosed. Love that. The dizziness does not have to be a part of getting old. No. And, you know, I, I bet Danielle agrees with me. I always tell people, if your doctor says it's just a normal part of aging, the first thing you're supposed to do is get a new doctor. <laughs> so I really like you too. That is awesome. <laughs> so are there, are there symptoms that, that people would not associate with their balance or anything that like they, you know what I mean? Like where it's kind of like a ninja symptom that you just <laughs> wouldn't, you wouldn't, you know, think that it was caused by your vestibular system. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there are some instances where people just feel off kilter. Maybe they just feel like they're floating or bouncing on their feet while they're walking. They might just feel a general sense of uneasiness out in public around busy environments where they can't acclimate themselves or become spatially aware of their body. Mm. Um, some people have difficulty with just fatigue and brain fog. Um, some patients even report having some eye soreness. You know, by the end of the day, they just need to close their eyes because they feel like they've been working so hard all day long that they're sore behind their eyes. Um, those are kind of some of those ninja-like symptoms that you're referring to. And some are just downright hard to explain. Um, a lot of people feel hesitant to explain their symptoms because they sound, quote unquote, crazy. Um, I've had patients tell me it feels like their brain is floating mm -hmm. or their brain is rattling around in their head that their eyes are jiggling or vibrating. Mm -hmm. um, some patients will say, when I make quick movements, it feels like it takes a second for the world to catch up to my head. Right. So these are some things that are very hard to express into words without feeling like someone's not gonna take you seriously, um, that are kind of hard to convey as the word dizzy. As clinicians, we hate the term dizzy because there's so mm -hmm. many different aspects of dizzy. It's kind of like telling somebody you're in pain. Well, what kind of pain is it? Is it burning, stabbing? Does is it feel numb? Does it radiate? Is it localized? There's a lot of different ways you can explain the term dizziness. So we use things like vertigo or having a rotational uh, movement or a false sensation of movement where there is no movement. There's disequilibrium where maybe somebody looking at you would think that you look perfectly fine, but you feel balanced, uh, imbalanced inside. Um, you might feel drunk or imbalanced where you just don't look right on your feet. And sometimes people can feel dizzy from exertion or anxiety causing issues as well. Wow. That's, that's such a good point. I Just to go off with that, um, you said you, you use the term vertigo, but I find even patients sometimes or people have trouble understanding what that means as well. You know, there's mm -hmm. an old movie called Vertigo that has to do with, you know, fear of heights and <laughs> an uneasy feeling looking over the edge of a tall building or something. And then that's a little bit confusing. So I actually, in my practice, give people a symptom questionnaire. And it has about uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, um, about 40 something words on it. And I just have them check these words off. So I get a feel for their symptoms and they tell me a lot about it. Drunk is one of them. You mentioned the word drunk, mm -hmm. but all these words that mean so much, and especially in an international city, like most cities now, you know, people use different words to describe the dizziness, but some of those just to show you. 
um, that point to the vestibular system or help me point to other things that might be confused with the vestibular system. Include words like reeling, undulating, feeling dazed, heavy-headed, and light-headed, of course, listing, which is our drifting, fuzzy-headed, staggering, drunk, whirling, floating, falling, confused, leaning, blurred vision, faint, warm, drifting, clumsy, swaying, weak, nauseated, vertigo is there. And I ask them, what do you mean by that? Because sometimes it means spinning and sometimes it doesn't. Difficulty focusing, that can be focusing your eyes or focusing your concentration. Mm. Uh, giddy, anxious, off balance, fluttering, disoriented, spinning, a rush, like a rush being pulled, fatigue, unsteady. So lots of words there. And I think that, that getting through the words and getting to the real symptoms is a part of it. And when I listen to a story, not only do I look at what words they check, I also want to know, is the feeling in their head or is it in their body? Is it the head feeling funny or is their body off balance? And I think that's part of how we peel the onion and try to get to the root of what's going on. And, that, and that's important. Sometimes the vestibular system can make the body off balance, but usually the vestibular problems also include a sensation in the head of some sort. Awesome. So of all the is there, well, with those disorders and those symptoms, is there a number of like different vestibular disorders or diseases? Hmm. Like I've heard of Meniere's disease and I've heard of vertigo, mm -hmm. like how many different things are there? <laughs> how it's Depends on which day of the week it is. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, I think the hard thing about a lot of vestibular disorders and dysfunction is that um, a lot of people look for the one diagnosis to explain everything. And unfortunately, in this patient population, a lot of times different diagnoses or disorders can mimic each other. They can run in tandem with each other. They can be secondary causes of different conditions in the vestibular system. For example, like Meniere's disease you had mentioned, it's not uncommon for those patients to have also BBDV or even a migraine component to their diagnosis. Um, vestibular dysfunction is very uh, vast in its diagnoses. And those diagnoses uh, tend to be, it seems ever growing. What do you think, Kathleen? Um, now that we're getting better at detecting things like vestibular migraine, yeah. persistent postural perceptual dizziness, there's right. a lot of, of new stuff that's popping up that um, requires us to kind of stay on top of and follow in the research to make sure that we are accurately diagnosing people who have gone misdiagnosed for a very long time. I, I think that's true. And for me, because I've been at this for more than 30 years now, I've watched the vestibular community um, add diagnoses to the list because there weren't very many when I first started. The first most common one, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo that Danielle mentioned is about the little particles out of place in the inner ear. I mean, that is one that often stands alone. And when we find it, we fix it. And that's kind of what makes us miracle workers or witch doctors, whichever way you, you look at it. But I mean, that's an impactful way to do it. And that is, that is if you're going to have one, I always say that's the best one to have. <laughs> Beyond that, you know, they get more complicated because they impact not only the inner ear, but the sensory perception and the central nervous system in a way that can make the problem more serious for a patient or more invasive to their lifestyle and rehabilitation can take longer sometimes with a vestibular rehab with a therapist in con in conjunction with pharmaceuticals and so um i think that yes they we've added things we've even added what she mentioned persist persistent perceptual postural dizziness is a is a functional disorder um that is difficult to diagnose. We diagnose that not by ruling anything in, but by ruling everything out. So I think sometimes we create names that sound like a disorder, but they're really a label for we don't really know. And yeah. um, I think that's interesting because that really piques the interest of those who are interested in lifestyle medicine and holistic health, like myself, and I know Danielle as well, and many physical therapists now looking at why are we having these unknown 
things that just aren't quite right. We can't rule anything in, but it sounds like it's involving this nervous system and the vestibular system, and what do we do about it? So, I mean, that's a whole nother hour conversation, <laughs> but those people are presenting with symptoms that make us think it's related to the inner ear gyroscope, the vestibular system, and the parts of the brain that um, compute and communicate that information to other parts of the body. The one thing I'd like to add on top of that is uh, just a little example of how the, the field is changing. Um, you know, being open to some of this new research coming out with different diagnoses and different ways to, to diagnose different disorders or dysfunction. You know, look at John Epley. You cannot say vertigo without hearing the word Epley maneuver in the same sentence. And that is something that's only been around since the late 70s, early 80s. You know, Dr. John Epley, when he came up with this idea of these particles being loose in your ear to create positional vertigo, that was completely against what was originally thought. It turned the entire theory of what people thought was going on on its head, and he was shunned from the medical community. People wouldn't let him present at conferences. Uh, we spoke to his daughter, and his daughter said that people would walk out of his lectures. It took forever to get that research um, uh, uh, published and people to actually start seeing the, the benefits of it. And yet now it's the biggest staple of one of the first things that we do when you talk about vestibular dysfunction and vestibular treatment. And that was only, that's in our lifetime. That was only a couple of decades ago. So in things my about life has changed. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. everything has changed since then. So um, one thing that's very exciting about this field is watching it grow, watching the new research come out and finally getting people help. You know, Meniere's disease is very, 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 uh, it used to be a very common diagnosis, but it's very overdiagnosed and misdiagnosed. So of the amount of people that are typically diagnosed in that year, only about one in 10 actually have Meniere's disease, Wow, which is mind blowing, right? There's maybe a different explanation as yes. to what's going on. <laughs> so when it comes to diagnoses, you know, and we talk to clinicians is you want to look at the patient and their story and their function and go from there. Don't treat them as a diagnosis when they walk into the door their history and the story that they're going to tell you when they come in is probably the most important, important part of your evaluation when it comes to treating this patient population. So because you have mentioned the word misdiagnosis quite mm -hmm. a few times, mm -hmm. oh, what is, if somebody has been going for years um, getting misdiagnosis and they know something's off, but they can't get help and stuff like that. I imagine you guys, when they find you, they're emotionally mm -hmm. at their, their breaking point or their wits in. So how, For sure. so I know the vestibular system does affect the emotions, but if you can't get help and you're really frustrated beyond, Absolutely. you know, your capacity, well, like, so how does that, well, how, I mean, I mean, I just imagine that's really got to, to weigh oh, on a person. Yeah. I want to answer that. And then that's a nice segue into um, how we try to communicate to people in our community, how we understand um, at the Vestibular Disorders Association, we are a place that we want people with these symptoms and with these frustrations to feel seen and heard. Because being seen, being heard, and being understood is really the first step to being healed. And until you feel seen, heard, and understood, you won't have resolution of your symptoms. And that is a beautiful thing I think about our job is that when they come to see us and we sort of open our arms and say, I hear you, I see you, you're not crazy, and I'm going to help you, that begins the big exhale, which makes room for the first inhale of hope. And um, that's why I think we have the best job in the world, and <laughs> Danielle agrees. And, and so... So when, when I look at a patient who perhaps has been down a road, I do it a couple of different ways. I mean, most of, many of my patients have been to many doctors or to other therapists. And because I have a concierge practice or a cash-based practice, um, it's common for people to see other people first and then come to see me when they don't have what they need. But I review medical records for sure. I say, what testing have you had? What do they say it is? But even 30 years into the work of vestibular rehab, it still happens that the patients say, I'm diagnosed with vertigo. And I'll say, well, but what did they say you have? Oh, I have vertigo. So it's, I tell people it's like saying you have a stomach ache. 
you've had this stomach ache for three years and they still tell you, you just have a stomach ache, you know, is your appendix about to rupture? Do you have a, a tumor? Do you have, you know, there's a gazillion things you can have. So it's a, it's a sadly continue misservice to people to tell them they are diagnosed with vertigo when in fact that's no diagnosis at all. So once you tell them that and you say, we're going to try to get to the root cause, but honestly, there's two ways of thinking about it. One, are you in pursuit of a diagnosis? Or two, are you in pursuit of wellness and feeling better? And I think that those are different and the first can get in the way of the second. So if it's not an easy clue for me to diagnose a patient um, and it's one of those ambiguous situations or maybe it's more than one thing, like Danielle mentioned, then it's really important for me to see past a specific diagnosis. And I tell a patient, you might see five different doctors and get five different diagnoses, but what we need to do is get you feeling better. How about that? How does that sound for you? And then we move towards that. So there's a little bit of grieving sometimes in some patients in knowing I'm not going to get a definitive diagnosis, but this person has tools to help me feel better. Does that make sense? No, that was great. That makes a lot yeah. of sense. I mean, it's, the, the patient population, so, you know, with the Vestibular Disorders Association is a great resource and a landing place for a lot of people who are looking for answers as to what could be going on with them. You know, it is, uh, it is so widespread in the amount of resources and help that it gives patients as far as um, medically advised and research-based articles, informational articles. There are, there's a big provider directory within VITA where you can search for a specialist near you based on location and what interests you're looking for. Um, there's support groups. It's, it's a great community that pulls these people in to at least make them feel like they're not alone. People suffering from vestibular dysfunction tend to do it um, by themselves or feel isolated. A lot of people can't understand what they're experiencing um, until they actually experience it themselves. So that's one problem that that patient population faces. And by the time they reach a clinician, they're frustrated, they have gone through years of misdiagnosed or not diagnosed well or not finding the right tool or therapy to help them. So this is a patient population that needs an ear uh, to be to listen to them, that needs somebody to sympathize and empathize and connect with them and make sure that they feel that they are working with the right person um, to help their symptoms. You know, I've had many patients exp express frustration. They say, I wish I just had cancer because at least I know there's a treatment for that. Oh, wow. I've had, yeah, I, it, it's a, it, people can get to a very dark place. I've had some people who have even reached the point where they were talking about end of life, you know, options because they couldn't deal with the rock and playing vertigo and the loss of everything they love doing. Um, you know, it is something that is very difficult, especially if you don't have a good support system or loved ones on your side who can help you out um, through everyday uh, needs and activities. So imagine taking everything that you love and not being able to do it anymore because you can't stand on your own two feet and safely walk around your home. You know, these, this type of dysfunction um, or disorders can really, really sideline you and make you scared that this is what the rest of your life is going to look like. So being a good ear for some of these patients is really, really important when it comes to evaluating vestibular um, dysfunction. And, you know, whether or not, you know, you come to a diagnosis, you might not meet a diagnosis. I, I try to educate patients a lot and say, listen, here's where we are finding the area of dysfunction. It's within your vestibular system. We can't put a name to it, but we know how to functionally address your symptoms to get you feeling better. Let's start there and then work through a multidisciplinary approach with your other doctors that you've been working with to figure this out. A lot of times, just that initial evaluation lifts a weight off their shoulders mm -hmm. and they feel so much better that somebody actually understands and listens to them, and they feel like they're on a path in the right direction. That's just really good information. Thank you both. Um, so I imagine, I imagine there are causes to some vestibular system disorders, like uh, a trauma. Um, and I also imagine that you said, and then, well, I'll get. You said thirty-five percent of people have a dis vestibular disorder over the That's age of forty. So, and then that just increases as you get, oh, mm -hmm. is our vestibular disorders, I guess, are those, are, are there preventable types, I guess, mm -hmm. is my question. Hmm. 
That's a great, that's a great question. Um, I think that as research develops, predictive validity or being able to predict what causes something and then to prevent it is at the very, very, very end of the road of understanding any condition. So prevention in the vestibular realm has not, in my knowledge, been specifically addressed because we're still classifying, qualifying, and identifying symptoms, whether they are anatomic in nature, meaning that there's some dis, um, something unusual about the brain and the skull and the vessels and the, the structure and function of the inner ear or the brain. Um, and so we're still looking at that. I, um, you know, Danielle, you might chime in with me, but I don't mm -hmm. think we have real prevention of them. Certainly, when you talked about trauma, we know that uh, a large number of concussive people with concussion will have vestibular problems. In fact, all sideline concussion protocols include an examination of the vestibular system to be used as identifying, you know, a, a um, concussion or a mild brain injury. Even without loss of consciousness, we look at eye movements and equilibrium to determine that. So, you know, avoiding traumatic concussive events um, is certainly important. Um, yeah. That would be yeah. true. I think as a vestibular therapist and a brain injury rehab therapist, I didn't put my kids in contact football. So, I mean, that would be prevention. But beyond that, I, I, I think healthy lifestyle prevents everything. And I think food is medicine. Yeah. So, well, it's, it's definitely for the, um, you know, the active lifestyle as a means of prevention. We do know, looking at the same study with uh, prevalence, they did find that there was higher uh, prevalence of vestibular dysfunction in individuals with higher cardiovascular risk. Right, so this is somebody who's smoked for 20 plus years, or if they have high blood pressure and diabetes, and they, that study actually found that people with diabetes were 70% more likely to have balance and vestibular dysfunction, which is huge. Um, and we also know some other predisposing factors that make somebody more likely to develop the, the most common condition, BPV, which is, you know, you know it occurs more in uh, females in comparison to males, especially if there is a history of osteopenia, um, again, those high cardiovascular risks, um, but another way to prevent a potential just natural decompensation with age is just to move. We have to really keep people moving and keep them active because it's kind of like a muscle. If we don't use it, it we will lose it. It'll start to become weaker. So then when there is a problem or some area of dysfunction, it feels amplified if you're working with a much weaker vestibular system. But the good news is, is you can always work on it. I mean, it, you can always strengthen that vestibular system to make it as strong as you possibly can. You know, there are other conditions in that younger age group, like uh, vestibular migraine and whatnot, that if you look at your lifestyle changes and preventative changes, you can look at your potential triggers, like different food triggers and make sure you're exercising more and increasing blood flow. There's a lot of things that you can do to ensure general health to help potentially avoid vestibular dysfunction down the road. That I think is what I was looking for right there. I know he wants to talk about move more, but I want to say one more thing. <laughs> I want to just, just tell the audience because I'm always teaching people to how to read and digest scientific information in this day of crazy research reports and, and confusion. <laughs> Remember that correlation is not causation. So I'm going to say that again. Remember, correlation is not causation. So yes, lifestyle and risk factors related to cardiovascular and diabetes and metabolic syndrome and on and on, all these things are correlated with more disease across the board, but we're yeah. not saying that they cause it. And that's going to be true even for COVID. When we look at some of the studies with COVID, you know, we have people, I, I was reading one study, um, well, Danielle and I both were looking at a study who was looking at possible vestibular impact from COVID. And these are people who struggled with symptoms for more than 30 days, which already puts them as outliers because most people don't struggle with COVID for symptomatically for more than 30 days. And, um, you know, what most recently this, this study looked at 50 people who had had more than a month of symptoms, which caused me to wonder what else was going on with them, you know? And so, yes, they had some hearing loss at very high frequencies, but I thought, well, this is a retrospective study. We're looking at them after their one month long symptomatic COVID. What did their hearing test look like before? We don't really know. So just be careful as you look and read things. And I just warn people remember to remember that correlation is not causation, but the bottom line of all those statements is healthy lifestyle, good food, good rest, 
and movement is the key. Avoiding obesity, avoiding smoking and moving. And I know, Tim, that's what you're all about. So we can talk about movement now and just, just how important that is because I think that's, you know, this post-COVID, we're getting people who, all my patients, they've been sitting doing nothing for 18 months. So. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I really don't want to talk about movement. I'm, 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 I'm sold <laughs> on movement. Um, but I do have a question since you uh, brought that up. And looking at your background, and it may, well, here's my question. Does gut health affect the vestibular system or vice versa? I, mean, I, get, I know the vestibular system affects the gut, but does gut health affect the vestibular system? Who, who do you want to hear from? Danielle, what do you say? Go ahead, Kathleen. That's well, all. I want to hear from uh, both of you. <laughs> well, it's, what I like about working with Danielle is she is, to me, and, and I don't feel old, so I'm not going to say that I am. I don't use that word. But she's such a younger generation. She's just she's like a mini me to me. I mean, you you have you're new <laughs> to the research and all these things, and I've been at this a long time. So, um, but I did study functional medicine for two and a half years, and then I went and got my doctorate. So I try to stay up to date. I'm a lifelong learner. But the idea of gut health and feeling normal is c- cannot be denied. The gut brain connection is undeniable. These things are moving into mainstream medicine um, at a pace that really excites me because I think that doctors are considering gut health and the microbiome as an important part of wellness. So when we look at these patients who just feel not quite right, and particularly with things like brain fog, dizziness, lightheadedness, and these things that don't feel like they're moving, Um, I always look at the gut. So I rule out a strong correlation with the vestibular system. And again, let me just repeat, I rule out the vestibular system when they say, I don't really feel like I'm moving. I don't feel like I'm swaying. And I check their eyes and they're normal and check their equilibrium and it's normal. They say, I just don't feel right. You know, so um, then the second thing is always, let's talk about your gut. Now there is... um, vestibular migraine that was mentioned earlier, I think it's becoming the misdiagnosis label, the Meniere's disease of the past that everybody's going to be diagnosed with. And I think vestibular migraine is going to surpass BPPV or positional vertigo as the most common vestibular syndrome that's being diagnosed. And it's largely, in my opinion, related to diet and lifestyle. So I, um, again, looking at triggers, like Danielle mentioned, for migraine. Vestibular migraine is a migraine episode, but maybe without pain, but where vertigo and disequilibrium is the symptom that presents Mm. in episodes and can be severe and is quite disabling. So I'm not going to say that these people, you know, have a terrible diet and if they just quit driving through, um, you know, McDonald's, they'll, they'll feel better. It can be tricky. But even before vestibular migraine was a diagnosis, and this does put me back, but I used to say, look at salt, sugar, caffeine, nicotine, alcohol. So I've said those words for a long time before we even had the word vestibular migraine. But salt especially is related to Meniere's disease. But salt, sugar, caffeine, nicotine, alcohol is related to lifestyle. And these are the things that we looked at. So, you know, long story short, honestly, I've was interviewed the other day and they said, tell me the three things that you think, you know, people need to quit doing. And I said, well, avoid obesity, avoid processed sugar and stay hydrated, you know, and stay flexible. So, I mean, there, there's, these are, these are lifestyle things. Um, yeah. Eat less, move more. It doesn't get everybody. It's eat better, move more. Yeah. I mean, my, my experience with the gut is actually more personal and anecdotal. Um, you know, I, uh, for years struggled with getting, uh, through autoimmune dysfunction and disease and learning all the different diets they wanted me to go on with that. And then I started to see a lot of comparisons and parallels between the patients I was helping when it came to Meniere's management or vestibular migraine. And it kind of put a little light bulb on in my head. I said, wait a second, like I'm having all these gut issues and address them, um, through an anti-inflammatory diet and different types of approaches of diets and supplements and these patients are also benefiting from something that's very similar in nature when you look at that. So there's definitely, a, in my opinion, in clinical experience, a connection to the gut there. And it's going to vary from person to person. It's not like Kathleen said, just cutting out McDonald's. I had a vestibular migraine patient where we did everything. We did the elimination diet. 
We cut out his daily half a glass of wine, all the cheese that he loved to eat. I mean, he went, he was so strict and so good, so type A about it. I remember there was a new study that came out that was identifying avocado as like this new trigger for mm. migraines. And at one, one appointment, I said, oh, you're going to be one of those weirdos that just gets triggered by avocado. He stopped and he looked at me. He goes, I have avocado toast every morning. <laughs> so as soon as we cut that out, like that was just the trigger for him. So the thing that makes, I think, vestibular dysfunction hard, um, even in just relationship to the, the talk of the gut, is that every single person is different. Mm. You can line up 10 vestibular migraine patients all in a line, and they will all present differently. They'll all have different triggers, and they'll all react differently to different types of treatment. So it's interesting to kind of to work with that patient population, not get frustrated, but also to keep that in the back of your mind that you have to be creative. You have to listen to each person and treat them individually, depending on what's going on with them in their lives. That's awesome. It is. I, I think vestibular therapists, I think people who have a therapeutic approach and heart and mindset like we do are really what the patient needs because this is a, can be a long game. And um, mm -hmm. I'm not anti-MD at all. I work within traditional medical model, um, but we have the time and have the interest and have the desire to listen to patients. And that is something that they just don't get when they're run through sort of the mill. But listening to your body is important and it's going to tell you that something's wrong so that comes out in lots of ways um a headache you know um a pain a backache a dizziness uh, there's all sorts of ways but listening to the body is what i want everyone to be able to do to say hey this means something's wrong and i don't know quite what it is but i want to work with somebody who fixes it and that's the perfect invitation for a holistic approach that includes lifestyle medicine. And I think that every physical therapist who works with this population has an interest in that and is open even to some of the complementary and alternative approaches that help just calm the nervous system and get people out of this fight, flight, or freeze and get them into a resting and restorative and a relaxing and rehabilitative state of the nervous system. I think that's the biggest societal illness for people right now is just this overactive sympathetic nervous system and where you know we can we have conferences now on you know sympathetic um, understanding the autonomic nervous system its importance in our hormones and our nervous system how it functions and how that relates to the gut and just remembering that 90 percent of the hormones in your nervous system are created in the gut so there is that connection so we look at you know dopamine and epinephrine and norepinephrine and we call it adrenaline or noradrenaline and these things are integrated integrated with the gut the gut health cortisol and the amount of sleep none of these things can be separated out so patients might see danielle and come with vertigo she'll fix it but then they leave 120 percent better because now she's talked to them also about these other things and that's what we want wellness so and i think this will be apparent to the listeners but just to let everybody in on you two, you're like vestibular juggernauts. Um, mm -hmm. Kathleen, you actually created the first vestibular rehabilitation program, one of the first in the world. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, go ahead. No, but go ahead. I don't know what you're going to ask me. <laughs> no, no. Uh, and 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 um, Danielle, you started vestibular today because you created a 3D model of the vestibular mm -hmm. system to educate lay people and and professionals and you have talk dizzy to me which i think is hilarious that's your podcast mm -hmm. if you're listening there's a podcast out there called talk dizzy to me um which is very funny to me uh, but mm -hmm. <laughs> but you guys like so i mean you are the juggernauts of the vestibular system and you're also members of, of veda where can and we have we our listeners are both i would call everyday folk they just want to feel better but we also have professionals that are always looking to better their craft too, so that they can help people better. So what are what are some good resources or how can people get in touch with you and where, where can the professionals go? Where can the, yeah. the regular folk go? Well, that's a, that's a great idea. Let me just, just add to that. So 
Um, the Vestibular Disorders Association has been around a long time, more than 25 years, and it just started out of a desire for people to understand and support each other who have vestibular problems. And I've been aware of it since the late 80s, early 90s, and uh, proudly now serve on the board of directors, as does Danielle. So I'm saying this not to brag or bring attention to us at all, but to say that it is a nonprofit organization that depends on volunteers. Our board of directors is made up not only of vestibular therapists and practitioners, but audiologists, physicians, patients, or people who themselves have had vestibular problems and or their caregivers or support system. So we have a volunteer board of directors who not just sits on high and directs the organization, but we do the work. Here we are doing this interview today and we run <laughs> our own practices and have our own day jobs, but we care enough about this situation in this community to really volunteer. So um, the organization looks like it's huge with teams of people and lots of money, but we are working it. So I have put in the chat for you, Tim, and I want to tell your listeners, the website to find the Vestibular Disorders Association is the word vestibular, that's a V, E-S-T-I-B-U-L-A-R dot O-R-G. So I put some links in the chat that you can maybe put and attach to this um, as it goes live. Will and that's do. where we have the provider directory. And there's a link for that where you can go put in your zip code, your state, your country. And we have a real international collection of um, providers who support VITA. And you'll see their badge that say they are professional members. So if you're a pro listening to this and you have an interest in or would like to work with vestibular patients or learn more about it, we have a lot of information there for you as well. And we depend on professional membership. So if you're a vestibular rehab therapist and you send patients to VITA, be sure to join us as a professional member because that's when you get that badge next to your name and you can be listed on our provider directory. And I'll, so one I'll say, thing, yeah. well, I was, I was going to piggyback on that, Kathleen, you know, when I first came out of PT school, I was already a vestibuloholic, uh, but still getting my feet wet. Um, I utilize VITA on almost a daily basis as a clinician, and I utilize them for their resources to give my patients, but also to educate myself. They've got a lot of really great articles on there that have been written by people on the medical advisory board, as well as researchers in the field. Um, but after I kind of been using their resources, their free resources almost every single day, I, I joined as a professional member, which gave me the opportunity of joining the provider directory list so people with vestibular dysfunction in my area could find me as a clinician. But it also gave me the opportunity to create co-brandable patient educational materials. It's all there already. It's, it's, you don't have to, to reinvent the wheel. You can go through and uh, print out patient education flyers to hand to your patients to give them the information they need with your logo on the top of it. Um, there's forums on there that I can refer mm -hmm. to in a professional forum I can refer to, and I get their um, quarterly newsletter, and I also get access to all of their training. So you had mentioned people that are getting into vestibular. Um, Vita puts a really great comprehensive list together of all the different uh, courses and trainings available around the country, around the world. Um, and I actually utilize that a lot to start building up more um, uh, more education and con continuing it through my career to kind of gauge who I want to go see and where I want to go and what's near me. So as a professional member and as somebody who is a clinician just utilizing Vita's resources, they're, they're the, the place to go. They're mm -hmm. the, the, not the first stop that you should go to when utilizing all of that. Um, and you get to have, we have really fun events coming up like um, Balance Awareness Week. Uh, mm -hmm. Go to Talk about it, that. Yeah. Well, Balance Awareness Week is kind of like my Christmas. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a, um, we have put this on once a year in September, usually during the first week of uh, fall or fall awareness week. Um, and this is just to help raise awareness for the term vestibular and people living with vestibular dysfunction. And the one thing that drew me to it was the use of the flamingo as our mascot, because flamingos can stand and balance on one leg, they even sleep on one leg. Um, but what I usually do for our clinic is we would deck it out in flamingos, put a bunch of informational um, did you knows all over the place, do a lot on social media. We have a lot of um, giveaways and fun photo contests of balancing on one leg, but it's a great way to make vestibular visible and help people get back onto their their journey of, to find balance. Kathleen, you got anything else to add to that? Oh, I also need to mention this year, we have something really cool. Um, 
we have created a six part docu-series called the Life Rebalance Chronicles. So if you are a clinician, if you are a family member or somebody suffering from vestibular dysfunction, you need to check this out on YouTube. It's called the Life Rebalance Chronicles. It's six about 10 minute episodes of nine different people living with vestibular dysfunction, um, talking about different aspects of their life, like their body, their mind, their spirit, their relationships. And it talks about what every day is like for them. So for people just getting into this, who might be a clinician or somebody who just wants to get a better understanding, watch this series because it's amazing how nine people from all over the world can talk about their stories and seemingly finish each other's sentences. You know, something that might sound crazy to one person or somebody might have a hard time um, reiterating or explaining out to somebody that they're talking to is being told the same story across the world. So it's called the Life Rebalance Chronicles. You can check that out on Vita's YouTube. Um, we even have some uh, interviews on our Facebook page where we talk to the cast a little bit more in depth about their experience with the project. But that's um, something that we've been ramping up with towards Balance Awareness Week, which is coming up um, right at the middle of September from September 19th to the 25th. So definitely make sure you guys check that out. That's awesome. I will make sure I put all of that <laughs> in the notes of the show so people can find the links and go right to it. Perfect. Guys, thank you so much. This has been uh, not only informative, but very fun. Uh, I, I love this kind of stuff. And you guys are certainly vestibular juggernauts. Um, thank you very much for, <laughs> for being on the show today. It was fun. It was our pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great weekend.